Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gareth Leonard. I'm the Managing Director of Regenesis. And I'm very pleased to be giving a webinar today for MSOC. It's a pretty big topic, but I'll be going through it in around about 45 to 50 minutes. Uh, as Sarah says, if you have got any questions, if you just type them as you think them, and uh, we will get back to answering them um, straight afterwards. And, and if you think of something uh, later on at the weekend, etc., please just email and, and we can answer those as well. Okay, so today I'll be just briefly introdu introducing myself and Regenesis, then I'll move on to what chlorinated solvents are, how they behave in the subsurface, and the natural process that is reductive to chlorination. I'll then talk about the, the, the history of trying to um, harness this method to effectively remediate chlorinated solvent sites, so how those substrates were developed, how enhanced reductive dechlorination works, uh, where it can be used, what level of contamination, what formations it can be used in, etc. I get on to the practical side of things of how to uh, apply these substrates, how to apply this technology, I then show you the expected results and some case studies exemplifying um, results from, from the real world. So, Regenesis, we provide injectable substrates for the remediation of contamination in groundwater. So we've been involved in enhanced reductive dechlorination since about 1998 when we produced our first product. We're based on R&D, so we produce these products from our laboratories in California. We then uh, help consultancies and contractors uh, use these products um, to do in situ remediation by doing bespoke designs per site. Um, or we can come to the site uh, and apply the products for you. So chlorinated solvents. There's a, there's a number of different chlorinated solvents that, that you may come across. The, the last one on this slide is, is the one that you will tend to come across on site. But if we start with uh, chlorinated alkanes, or chlorinated methanes, you might come across um, carbon tetrachloride. Um, it's a, it was used as a refrigerant, um, it was used as a, a, a precursor for, for making other refrigerants, cleaning agent, uh, fire extinguishers that used to be used in chloroform you might come across, um, that's used to make PTFE, etc. So you may come across these contaminants when they've been spilt in, in the ground at manufacturing facilities. Chloroethanes, generally used as, as solvents, um, these you uh, will see at manufacturing facilities again as a general rule, but generally what you're going to come across are the chlorinated alkenes. Um, this is PCE, tetrachloroethane, and that's the dry cleaning fluid. And, and a lot of these sites typically uh, that we're remediating are, are dry cleaning sites. You'll also see these contaminants where they've used them in uh, workshops, where you're looking at um, cleaning up oils, taking oils off metals, etc. And the reason you tend to see them is that the, the belief back in the day was because they're so volatile that really you could just pour them away and they would volatilize. But the problem is they didn't all volatilize and they sink into the ground. So I'll come on to, to what that is. And, and then they tend to stay in the ground for a very long time. There was a long period as well in which people didn't really know how to address this contamination. And we're really seeing nowadays that this is a, a, a very important contaminant that, that people are uh, remediating every day across Europe. So there's the breakdown products um, of the uh, PCA. So why deal with chlorinated solvents? Well, they are a carcinogen. Um, and they do tend to spread out. They do tend to cause very large problems and they, they are a problem at low concentration. So just as an example, if we take an Olympic swimming pool, so 2,500 cube of water, if we were to pollute that with PCE to above drinking water standards, which is 10 micrograms per litre, we would only need 15.6 milliliters of PCE to do that. And that's the equivalent of one tablespoon. So a tablespoon of PCE into that amount of water makes it undrinkable, makes it polluted essentially. Now, if you consider the subsurface and that that's effective porosity, this one tablespoon of contamination is basically impacting an area of 12,500 uh, meters squared. So these, 
these products, even in small amounts, can cause very large issues. And very much uh, the plumes that you come across with chlorinated solvents tend to be much larger than the likes of petroleum hydrocarbons, etc. Uh, they are large scale issues. So the contaminant behavior. <clears throat> This is my first video, so hopefully it will work. What we have here is a, a factory or a dry cleaner. We've spilt the contamination in the ground. It's gone through the Vado zone into the alluvium. Groundwater is flowing from left to right. Red is bad on this drawing. So what's happening is the contaminant plume is being moved down gradient. It moves beyond the site boundary. So you've now got a liability for the uh, manufacturer or the, the industry. It then can impact the aquifer itself, making the water unusable, um, so it affects public water. Chlorinated solvents have uh, a, uh, a low vapor pressure, so they can cause issues in terms of on the factory themselves or nearby residential properties that can be a human health risk. And then of course, you've got surface or controlled waters that they, these can impact as well. Uh, and affect flora and fauna. So chlorinated solvents can have a big effect over a, over a large area. Looking a bit closer at what they do when you spill them, we've got the release point at the surface there. The contamination moves down through the Vado zone and gets to the groundwater. Now, if it was a petroleum hydrocarbon, it would float on the surface. If you had a lot of Elnapple, light non-aqueous phase liquid, you could then pull that off, you could pump that away and then deal with the dissolved phase, which would be moving down gradient from the spill location. It's a little bit different with chlorinated solvents. They're heavier than water, so they want to sink, and they've got a very low viscosity, so they can percolate, they can infiltrate a long distance. Now, they will move according to gravity. So where you spill may not be your only source location. It may not be the only place that you get denapple, dense non-aqueous phase liquid. Because the chlorinated solvents, as they're moving under gravity, may find bedding planes, may find cleavage planes, and they may move up gradient of where your source, where your spill was. So you can find this contamination spread uh, right across your site at very different concentrations. And also vertically, the level of contamination can change quite dramatically. The other thing is the Dean apple tends not to be found as a pool. Um, as it's moving down, this is a contaminant, or these are contaminants that don't want to be in groundwater. They're not particularly soluble. So as they're moving down, they're coating the subsurface. They're leaving globules of themselves behind. They're leaving ganglia of, of material throughout the subsurface. If you have a very large mass, you may end up with a Dean apple pool, but more often than not, you get um, Dean apple and sorb material spread uh, throughout. And then, of course, you get a dissolved phase plume as well, because although they're not particularly soluble, they're soluble enough to cause a problem. Once the Dean apple gets to the top of a bedrock, what you'll find is that it builds up on top of fractures and the hydrostatic pressure eventually becomes higher than the capillary pressure of those fractures and the liquid moves down into those fractures. Now, you would think then that if you wanted to remediate that, you could then go and pump the Dean apple out of those fractures. What happens once it's in these locations, and this is a bedrock, but on the next slide, I'll show you how it works in heterogeneous formation as well, is once the product moves into these fractures or permeable zones, you've then got a concentration gradient between the permeable zone and the impermeable zone through the mobile prosty and the immobile prosty. So here we've got the fracture within the bedrock, and then you've got, uh, a, 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 let's say it's a chalk or a limestone. You've got a porous matrix that doesn't contain the contamination. So you've got a concentration gradient from the fracture into the bedrock matrix itself. So through fixed law, you're driving contaminant movement from that fracture into the matrix of the bedrock itself. So it's not a movement of water containing contamination, it's contamination moving through water through diffusion. So what happens is that contamination goes into the matrix. So if you were then to try and clean out the, the fractures themselves, you're not getting all of the contamination. It's, it's not easily recoverable. 
looking at this in a heterogeneous aquifer, here we've got, we've zoomed right in here. So we've got a, a sand, a sandy layer within a clay. We've got um, low permeable clays, and then we've got a sort of dead end zone there where you're not getting a lot of flux. So let's put some chlorinate solvents into there. Groundwater flows from left to right, and the plume moves from the left, and it fills that permeable zone. The contamination will move along these permeable zones. It will move along flux zones within the formation themselves. It then diffuses into that immobile porosity, uh, and, and you build up contamination in there. Now, if you go in and do pump and treat, if you go in and do chemical oxidation, if you do an advective process where you're dealing with the permeable uh, porosity, with the, uh, the permeable zones, you'll clean out that contamination, you'll get good recovery early on, but then what you'll find is that you've reversed the concentration gradient. So now you have a low concentration in those permeable zones and a high concentration in the immobile porosity where the contaminant now lurks. So that that concentration gradient is moving in the opposite direction. So you get back diffusion, you get movement of contamination from this immobile porosity back into the mobile porosity. Now, what this would mean is if you are pumping, um, you may never get to target because this is always coming back at you. Or it might mean if you switch off, you get rebound because you're not pulling that out and, and you're back to where you start. And this tends to be, this back diffusion tends to be uh, the one of the, well, it's the most important problem uh, in plumes, whereas in a source area, you're concerned about rebound due to desorption. Here in a plume, you don't have much mass um, sorbed to the contamination. So it's this back diffusion that you're fighting with. So when you're looking at treating these sites, finding the source areas and the plume areas, you know what you're up against, whether it's back diffusion or, or desorption. So this is a study from the University of Colorado by Donor and Sale. Um, you're looking at a Perspex sandwich box. The H is just a frame that holds it all together. There's sandy layers there, um, which is the light color. And then within that, you've got these uh, clay lenses. So what that shows is that it, it's supposed to be a heterogeneous formation. We're going to pollute this formation with some fluorescein. So I'll put this on. If you ignore the numbers in the left, this actually happened over several days. Um, so there you go, there's the contamination coming in. So you can see the flows from left to right, the contamination comes in, it moves through these permeable zones. Now, if I keep it going, you'll see that the clay is starting to glow around the edges. So you're getting that diffusion of contamination from the permeable zone into the impermeable areas. What we'll then do is use a pump and treat system to clean that out. So you'll see that soon. So there we go. We've pumped out the contamination from those permeable zones, got rid of a load of contamination, all good. But you'll see now that the edges of that clay are impacted with contamination. And you'll see here, what they do here on this test is they keep pumping. So you'll see these trails coming off in this direction. That um, the, this is the, the, the back diffusion. This is the contamination moving back into the permeable uh, porosity, into the permeable formation. Okay. <clears throat> so what I'll be going through today is a way of treating the contamination both in the permeable and impermeable zones. And that's through the injection of substrates that then cause enhanced reductive dechlorination both within the permeable zone and then they actually diffuse active ingredients into the immobile porosity or they treat within the permeable zone and remain within there. So when you get back diffusion, you're dealing with that contamination as it comes back to you. So I just want to show you this graph, which was from a site that I dealt with uh, many, many moons ago. Um, it was a pump and treat system being used on a TCE uh, plume. And the consultant came to us. They'd been doing pump and treat for a very long time, and they just weren't getting uh, the response they wanted, they were never going to get to target. You can see that the level is going down on the left-hand side of that graph, but it's, it's, it's very gradual. You've got a very long half-life. So what they wanted to do was move to enhanced reductive dechlorination. Now, if you look on the right-hand side of the, that graph, we in, introduce a, a product called hydrogen release compound to cause enhanced reductive dechlorination. And you see, you get some great results there. Come, come straight down, 
we get a much uh, shorter half-life, we're getting lower concentrations, that's great. Now I'll come on to why that happens, but one thing that I thought was interesting from this graph that they, they sent to me uh, after we'd done the treatment, is if you see the pump, just look at the pump and treat side of things, they switched off that pump at say month 22. Now, we, at that, at that point, they were at a concentration of 2,000 microgram per liter. The HRC treatment didn't start at 2,000 microgram per liter, it started at 4,000 microgram per liter. So in that period when the, the system had been switched off, you can see the rebound that occurred through back diffusion. So that, that, that pump and treat was, was fighting that back diffusion all that time. And then when you switch off, you, you see that hidden mass, okay? And, and then the enhanced reductive dechlorination then deals with that entire mass. So, reductive dechlorination. So, my, it's, a, it's a respiration reaction. So, microbes cascade electrons from an electron donor to an electron acceptor, generating energy that they then need to live. Right, that sounds pretty complicated, but aerobic respiration, you're all doing it right now. Well, those of you eating biscuits or having your lunch while you're listening to this. So, you eat your biscuit, you breathe oxygen, enzymes in your gut, react the biscuit, the donor, to the oxygen, the electron acceptor, energy is released and you absorb that energy to grow. It's the same process, um, it's an anaerobic reaction, it's anaerobic respiration, but it's the same process that we harness in this situation. So here we're going to be adding an electron donor, we're going to be adding hydrogen, and then on the right there I've got a list of electron acceptors, including chlorinated solvents. Now you'll see I've put chlorinated solvents quite low on that list. This is because it's the amount of energy that you get from that reaction. You might put hydrogen into the ground, you might put a substrate into the ground because you want to deal with those chlorinated solvents. But there are, if there is oxygen in there, if there's nitrate in there, if there's iron, if there's sulfate, there are other microbes in the ground that will say, thank you very much, take that hydrogen and do something else with them. They'll break down that nitrate, they'll break down that iron. So you have to scour them away. You have to take into account the competing electron acceptors. So when you're doing a design for enhanced reductive dechlorination, don't just concentrate on the chlorinated solvents. You have to look at the geochemistry as well. What are the competing electron acceptors and, and what are we going to have to do about those uh, to, to drive the remediation of the chlorinated solvent? So the reductive dechlorination process, we provide the hydrogen, we have reductive dechlorinating bacteria, dehalogenating bacteria. And what they do with this respiration reaction is they snap off a chlorine and they attach a hydrogen. That's the respiration reaction that they do. Energy is given off during this process, which they then absorb, grow more microbes, so you get a bigger biomass, so it speeds up the process. You maintain those, and they'll break down that contamination. So when you do that to PCE, you've got four chlorines, you snap one off, you're then left with three chlorines, so you have TCE, which then breaks down to DCE, then breaks down to vinyl chloride, then breaks down to ethene, and that's when you've got full uh, reductive dechlorination, all the chlorine's gone. That ethene will then break down, you'll fully mineralize through ethane to carbon dioxide and water. So you're left with, with nothing. You're left with carbon dioxide and water on, on the side of the, the contaminant. And often the substrates you're using, they're just organic materials, so they will bro break down and be gone. So it, it's a great process in that you're not leaving anything in the subsurface following treatment. So it's a naturally occurring biological process, but why do we not see it quite so much then if it's naturally occurring? You need a carbon source, and it tends to be that these systems that you come across when you're doing your site investigations are carbon limited. So you might find that there are organics in the subsurface, like a peat layer, producing humic acids. These humic acids can be then used, they'll ferment, produce hydrogen, act as an um, electron donor, you may find that you've got a nearby hydrocarbon plume. Some of you may have done site investigations on dry cleaner sites. They often have steam boilers on some of these older sites as well. So as well as spilling chlorinated solvents, they're also spilling oil. And what you can find is in the areas around the, 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 the boiler, you've got reductive dechlorination going on because you're adding petroleum hydrocarbons to the ground as well. So you can actually drive reductive dechlorination of, of chlorinated solvents by spilling fuel on top of them. 
I'd suggest you don't do that, but the, it, you, it is something that you can come across on these sites. Septic fields, you may find that um, septic tanks or, or um, sewage lines are broken, and these will drive reductive dechlorination. But generally, these natural sources are in limited supply, and you're left with, with uh, carbon-limited situations. If you have a carbon-limited situation, what you'll find is anaerobic biological degradation. The microbes will concentrate on the easy meals, which is the PCE and the TCE, and they'll leave on the side of the plate the DCE and the vinyl chloride. And that's where you can, when you're looking at these natural systems, you sometimes see that they're just stuck. They're kind of stuck around the DCE vinyl chloride area, and there's a little bit of that just building up. So people looked at this process, people started to become interested in reductive dechlorination because of some very high level spills um, such as Love Island uh, in America and decided that they wanted to try and, and drive this process further. Um, this was about three decades ago that this, they started looking at enhanced reductive dechlorination. So the, the first iteration was to use soluble substrates. So what you want to do is, is get something that rots. You want to get something that ferments in the subsurface. So people uh, look at sugar. You can put sugar water in the ground. You can use molasses. Uh, you can even use alcohol. Um, you're looking at waste. Uh, I'm not sure how much alcohol actually gets put in the ground or goes home with the drillers, but you know you get the idea. But it's it's often it's waste products from other industries that are nice and cheap, they're nice and soluble that you put in the ground, and you can drive this reductive dechlorination. So I'll talk about this from a historic point of view. There are there are still people doing it this way, and and I'm sure they do it very well. And I don't want to knock them, but I, I'll explain the issues that were were encountered during the 90s with this, uh, and why it drove the the development of substrates. So the advantage is that um, the substrates are cheap; they're easy to come by. They're often waste products, uh, and you you get to control how you inject them in the ground. It's very easy uh, to, to control where you're putting them. So it's flexible, it's cheap. The disadvantages are numerous in that you inject the product in the ground, but because it's so soluble, it's used up very rapidly. So you have to apply more product. So it might be cheap to buy the, the substrate, but you then have to buy more of the substrate. Because you're reapplying it in the ground, you won't be doing it through direct push injection because you'd have to mobilize a rig every time, you'll be injecting through uh, an injection well. Now, if we all cast our mind back to when we were students, the kitchen sink in our student house was probably not the healthiest place in the world. There'll have been a lot of food waste going down there. And what you would have got is it would eventually block from time to time. And that would be because of the organic material going down there. You get a biofilm growing in the pipework and it, and it, and it causes a blockage. That's what you get with these injection wells. Now in a kitchen, you can put caustic soda down, you can put biocide down, break up that microbial film and continue to use the sink. On your site where you're trying to grow these microbes to break down the contamination, you don't want to be putting a biocide down there. So you have to drill another well. So there's costs involved there. The other thing that happens is because it's they're so soluble, you can you can drive the redox down too quickly. So the redox goes past the the um, sweet spot for reductive dechlorination. You want it to be round about minus 150 to minus 200 millivolts. So as that redox goes past, you're only getting reductive dechlorination of those, that PCE and TCE. You might not be getting full reductive dechlorination. Then the products all used up again and it's gone again so you have to keep reapplying and you're getting an inefficient process if you put too much in you might get the redox down to minus 220 or lower and then you're waking up archaea now archaea uh, a primordial soup you know they, they've been around since the start of life on this planet once you wake them up they're going to take all of your hydrogen and they're going to out compete everything and they produce methane the methanogens so you can cause methane to build up as well on your site uh, which is not what you want to do. So there's a number of issues with this that led to the development of controlled release substrates. Um, we released a product in 1998 called Hydrogen Release Compound, but obviously there are lots of other substrates out there. The idea behind these would be was to get an organic material that you just have to inject the once, and then it provides a controlled release of organic material, a control that will 
will ferment and pr provide hydrogen. So you're avoiding uh, reapplication costs. Uh, you're, you're keeping the redox at the right level by controlling the release of organics from this material. Um, and it's driving full reductive dechlorination. You, you don't become carbon limited at any point. You continue the carbon supply until you get full reductive dechlorination of the entire contaminant mass. So here we see um, we've got an alcohol and a, a lactic acid. And what we've done is we've tacked this lactic acid onto the carbon chain of an alcohol through a, an ester bond. So it's a condensation reaction. You basically take the water out of the system and, and, and you can attach the lactic acid in that way. You repeat this process so that you get tetramers of lactate on this carbon backbone. And what that means is lactic acid, which is very soluble, you then get um, a, a lot of it condensed together in, in a generally quite a gloopy material. These tend to be low volume type materials. So it, you've engineered a, a molecule, but you've made it from natural materials. You then inject that in the ground, and I'll come on to how the injection process uh, happens later on. Because you made it by taking water out, when you put it into the groundwater, it starts to break down. The water's getting into the molecule, breaking down those ester bonds, and that's how you're getting a controlled release. You're having a controlled release of these uh, organic acids over whatever period, depending on the product, and that gives you the, 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 the constant carbon source. So that was all good, and, and you know, they remediated thousands of sites with these products, but they are low volume products and chlorinated solvent um, sites can be very big. This is a site of ours in the, just north of Venice. It's a six hectare site. Uh, um, when you get a little bit closer, there's about 20,000 meters squared impacted with chlorinated solvents moving from the factory on the right there across to the, to the river. And if we were to inject using um, one of these original substrates, to get interlocking radii of influence, you would need to inject on something like a two or three meter grid. So across the site of this size, that's thousands of injection points, which makes it uh, expensive. So this is just one example. Many, many chlorinated solvent sites are very large. So there's a drive to create substrates that can give you a much wider radius of influence, um, so that you can reduce the number of injection points um, and, and remediate these larger sites economically. It's kind of a difficult thing to do if you think about it because you want to put something in the ground that will move so it has to be soluble, but then not wash away, so it has to stick. But if it sticks and it's not soluble, then it's not getting into the groundwater and dissolving and driving reductive dechlorination. So it, it, was, it was developing these different techniques was something that happened over time, the, the, you might have heard of emulsified vegetable oils, a bit like uh, vinaigrettes that, that, that you get on salads. I'm from the north of England, so I've only had these salad things described to me. But basically, you, you're mixing water and oil together. You might add some emulsifiers, and, and that helps it move through the formation. Uh, we have a, a product that avoids the use of oil. People, other people move towards soluble substrates. But the idea was to create this generation of products that can then deal with uh, much larger uh, sites. Just to illustrate that point, if we took a, an imaginary site 30 meters by 30 meters and we decided to inject uh, a substrate into the ground across that, if we were using a low volume product, we might inject on a two meter spacing, we'd need 225 points. That's pretty close spacing to be honest, but just as an example. And that would take one rig an entire month to do that work. If we were able to swap to a product that, that moved further in the formation without washing away, we could um, expand the gaps between the injection points, reduce the number of injection points that way. So if we went to five meter spacing, we go from 225 points down to 36 points. So we're done in a week. And that of course makes it safer. It means you, you've got less uh, dead drilling time, which is, drilling down to where the groundwater is, there's less disturbance on site, and, and it's much, much cheaper. So, so trying to use the, these uh, next generation, uh, higher volume products um, really uh, drives uh, the, the ability to, to treat these sites economically. 
And there is there is now a uh, move to create new substrates, liquid activated carbon approaches that drive enhanced reductive dechlorination, which I won't go into here, uh, but that's a sort of history of developing up to, to roughly where we are now. So how enhanced reductive dechlorination works? You take your engineered substrate and you put it into the groundwater. It then starts to dissolve. You need it to dissolve. It needs to be in the groundwater. The microbes that are breaking down the contamination live in the groundwater. And so you, you put it in, it dissolves gradually over time. And, and, these, and then the, the, the parts that are dissolving as it breaks down, they then ferment. So the process is a two-stage biological process. The first stage is, is through fermentation. So these, these bacteria, these microbes, don't take part in the reductive dechlorination process, but what they do do is they break down the substrate that you've put in the ground. So here we can see lactic acid being broken down to pyruvic acid, down to acetic acid. Every step of the way along there, there is a waste product produced, and that is dissolved hydrogen. So that dissolved hydrogen is an excellent resource for reductive dechlorinators. But of course, as I said before, we've got to get the, the, the aquifer, we've got to get rid of those competing electron acceptors, we've got to get the aquifer in the right conditions for reductive dechlorination, so we call it acclimation of the aquifer. So just a, a note on here, these are lines of evidence that support the fact that we've got reductive dechlorination going on. If you're doing a reductive dechlorination um, project, what are you actually showing at the end of this to your client or to the regulator? There's very little to see at the surface. Uh, you've not dug out any soils and taken them to a landfill. It's coming down to results, it's coming down to monitoring, it's coming down to, to graphs. And, and what you need to show is that the level of contamination, yes, it came down from the start to the finish, but you need to show other evidence that proves that you put the product in the ground, that you created the right conditions, that you got rid of competing electron acceptor. And it's these multiple lines of evidence that make you able to show what is going on on your site and also react should things not be going as well as you hoped. And, and also taking this data at the start allows you to get the most accurate design. So I'll set this animation off, but basically the, this TOC, the total uh, organic carbon or DOC, the dissolved organic carbon, it's the amount of carbon in the, in the system, in the subsurface. So you're putting in a substrate, which is, is generally made of carbon. So you'll see this go up and it'll, it'll stay up um, as your product uh, is active in the subsurface. You then start to see the dissolved oxygen come down. Hopefully this animation will switch on. Here we go. The dissolved oxygen comes down as we create anaerobic conditions and we scour away all of the oxygen. The redox will drop and we want to try and aim for about minus 150 to minus 200. And then you've got competing electron acceptors that will scour away either completely in the case of nitrate. You might not get rid of all of the sulfate, but you don't need to. And you create this large biomass of dehalogenating bacteria that then become dominant within the consortia so that they can use all of that hydrogen to break down your chlorinated solvents. So put in the product, it dissolves, it ferments, produces hydrogen, you acclimate the aquifer, and then you get enhanced reductive dechlorination. So there's your PCE, you've got hydrogen in the system, promotes the growth of reductive dechlorinating bacteria. They take that hydrogen, they snap off a chlorine, attach the hydrogen and take energy from it. The PCE breaks down to DCE, down to vinyl chloride, to ethene, to ethane and full mineralization. And you can see as you're getting down there that the microbes may change. Uh, Dehalococoides is an important microbe for, for breaking down the, the vinyl chloride. Generally, what we're talking about here is, is supporting indigenous microbes. Microbes grow exponentially, which is pretty quick. So you might, you might do analysis of the microbes prior to applica application of your substrate and show that you don't have any decalococoides. When you create the right conditions, these microbes will grow and they will become dominant given the, the, the right conditions. Um, I'll come on to bio-augmentation in, in, in a couple of slides as to, to whether that, that is helpful or not. But these are the, the, the sort of results you would expect to see from the process I've just gone through there. 
so the the x-axis here is is distance down gradient from a from a barrier application but it's um if you think about this over time as well it can be time also on the x-axis so we inject the product in between those two uh, dashed lines the redox drops creates the right conditions for reductive dechlorination pce then breaks down and is gone that as it breaks down it's producing tce so if you think of the production of tce it, it, like a bath with the tap on but the plugs open so the tce is also being broken down at exactly the same time and um, so that's the, the the plug hole but the pce is also being broken down and creating tce so that's the tap so you see that the tce builds up the bathtub fills up a little bit but then as the pce is gone and removed there's no source there's no influx of tce anymore so the taps turned off and that tce drains out and you'll see the tce then cre uh, creates the dce creates the vinyl chloride you then got ethene uh, and ethane so dce tends to be the one that you'll see a bit of a lump because tce breaks down so quickly dce is a bit slower vinyl chloride doesn't tend to build you tend to get about 10 percent of the, the the parent compound starting concentration at most ethene um just a note ethene isn't on your voc suite so it's something to ask for um, when you're doing validation um to to show that you're getting full reductive dechlorination so yeah by augmentation i said that uh, mo mostly what i've been talking about here is um biostimulation so you create the right conditions and the indigenous microbes will then degrade the contamination you can bio augment uh, we bio augment in in some situations um it's best to acclimate the aquifer first if you've done a test in an aerobic aquifer and said there's no dehalococcoides if you inject the dehalococcoides into that situation there'll still be no dehalococcoides because they'll just die in aerobic conditions so you create the right conditions you can then help promote um, this this uh, reductive dechlorination biological activity by putting in the right microbes with them as well and we tend to find that 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 uh, speeds up the onset of reductive dechlorination it can reduce some of the the the, the buildup of uh, breakdown products and sometimes when you've got chlorinated ethenes and ethanes the microbes can fight a little bit in terms of who's getting all the hydrogen um, so you might find that TCA has to wait until all the TCE breaks down etc so bio augmentation in those situations can help too so applicability of enhanced reductive dechlorination am I doing on time pretty good okay so you might have seen a graph like this before this is remedial treatment approaches um, the treatment efficiency on the y-axis the amount of contamination on the x-axis if this was petroleum hydrocarbons and you were in a source area you'd have a spill of oil you'd start on the right there you'd have um, free floating l apple on the surface you would do physical remediation pump out what you can uh, your pump and treat system will become inefficient so you need to switch to chemical oxidation break down a lot of the mass that's been left in the subsurface but that's not going to get you to really low concentrations efficiently so you move on to biological degradation that will allow you to then hit those lower concentrations with enhanced reductive dechlorination you can actually push this graph a little bit and this is because of the way the dean apple is spread out and also the way the microbes behave and and, and the process itself so basically this biological process can deal with dean apple it can nibble away at the dean apple and that's mainly because you're not you don't tend to have big pools of this dean apple you've got ganglia you've got some sorbed phase you've got globules of the material the other thing to bear in mind is you've got these microbes that specialize in breaking down a contaminant that doesn't want to be in the groundwater but these microbes live in the groundwater so what they do is they produce a biosurfactant that drives these contaminants into the groundwater so that they can break them down the other thing is every time you break down a chlorinated solvent the breakdown product is slightly more soluble so if you've got a globular pce only a tiny fraction of the, that globule is biologically degradable just a little bit around the edges that is um, slowly dissolving into the groundwater that edge that corona will then degrade to TCE now that TCE is still not particularly soluble but it is more soluble than the PCE it, it will partition back into the PCE globule to get out of the groundwater essentially so what's happened to that globule is it's just become a little bit more soluble 
And that TCE will break down to DCE, that'll partition back in, and the globule becomes more and more soluble, and it breaks into two globules, it breaks into four globules. It starts to, to break down and eventually breaks into the groundwater. So I'll show you in the results section in a little bit. When you in, inject in areas where you have high concentrations, expect to see the levels go up in the groundwater. You're not creating contamination, it just means that the groundwater samples are now more indicative. And, and it's a key point, you know, you, when you're sampling groundwater for chlorinated solvents, you're sampling for a contaminant that doesn't want to be in groundwater by sampling groundwater, okay? So you need to bear that in mind. That said, if you have lots and lots of Dean apple, if you do have a pool of Dean apple, you might want to do some physical treatment. You might do some excavation, pump and treat. You might run SVE in the Vado zone above your treatment zone. You might do some chemical oxidation in source areas, or you might want to introduce um, some ISCA into some source areas as well. So application methods, another video. If you remember the one at the start where we had the, the, the factory, uh, with the contamination uh, spreading underneath the buildings, etc. This is in plan view. So we have the contamination spreading from left to right. Now we'll zoom in on the site itself where we're going to do the remediation and we'll do an injection grid across the plume. Now you might think that we'd put an injection grid right across that plume, but what we've done there is done a grid in the source area where we need to do lots of treatment. And then in the plume area, to save on the amount of drilling, to save on the amount of treatment that we need to do, what we're doing is putting a series of barriers into the subsurface. And what that does is it treats those areas, it creates a treatment zone, and then the impacted groundwater upgradient moves down into those treatment zones in order to degrade all of the contamination. And we can design how, well, design the dose within those barriers, and design the space in between those barriers uh, based on how fast the groundwater is moving um, because we want all of the contamination to move through those tra treatment zones within the lifespan of the treatment substrate. So application methods, if you're using a low volume product. Uh, this is tends to be what you'll see. Uh, you'll see something fairly goopy going into a uh, grout style pump. So something that pumps fairly slowly, um, but can manage high pressure. You might be injecting into a clay, you might be injecting into a silt, something like that. So the product itself is going to go into the subsurface. It's not going to move very far, but then it's going to diffuse the active ingredient beyond how far you inject it in order to try and get interlocking radius of influence from the injection. And you might inject through a number of means. Um, you've got uh, direct push machines, uh, window sampling rigs, you've got dando rig, you've got something made of Meccano on the, on the right there. Uh, it can be used in um, bedrock as well. And the drilling looks pretty impressive. If you look in the middle there, the applications in the bottom right, you're just pouring it into uh, a, a well and that particular well is 40 meters deep. So just using um, the hydrostatic pressure of the product itself, it drives itself in, into the formation. So fairly straightforward approach. If you're using uh, higher volume products on, on, on large scale plumes, you're gonna be mixing something up most likely. You're gonna be diluting it. You're gonna be creating a micro emulsion. This is our micro emulsion here. Looks like milk, I promise it's not milk. So you make it up in a tank and then you inject it into the subsurface using direct push generally, which is a, a point on the end of a hollow stem rod. The rod's got spring-loaded ports in it. So you drive them into the ground and you pump and you can, you can decide how much goes in at what depth. On the right there, we've got a speeded up process in, in Finland where we're doing some injection of, of 3DME. And, and not only are you going across the site uh, on an, an injection grid to target the contamination, but you're, you're, you're changing the dose as you go down through the formation, or you might do what's called bottom-up injection, so you move up through the injection, because as you saw in, in one of the earlier pictures in this presentation, the level of contamination can change vertically, quite dramatically with chlorinated solvents. So when you're doing your site investigation for chlorinated solvents, remember, Delineation is not just important laterally, but it's important vertically as well. You can inject via uh, wells as well, just to ensure that you've got a um, cement uh, cap on there or, um, so that the well doesn't move out of the, the ground. 
this is me pretending I go on site these days, but what I'm holding is a stinger and packer assembly. So what you do is you'd lower that into the well, energize or inflate the donut packer so that the stinger, the, the pipe stays in place, and then you can inject into that well uh, without losing the product out of the well. You can use um, double packers so that you can inject in different uh, levels within the well so that you can target different zones of contamination. So results. I've got another animation which I'm going to play a, a couple of times, I think, just so that you can see. If you look on the right, ignore the bit on the left for the time being, in that source area, the contamination is broken down. And then you notice the barriers, you create these treatment zones where you break down the contamination, but then that contamination moves into those treatment zones and is broken down. So you, you get that treatment in the source area, then the barriers, and then it deals with the contamination that moves through. Let me play that again. So if you look on the left now, over time, you'll see the, the height of that bar goes down. So that's the total amount of chlorinated solvents goes down over time. So you break down that contamination over time. The amount of mass in the site goes down. Let me just play that again. Now look at the color of the bar and you'll see that the relative amount of chlorination of the contamination also reduces as time goes on. So you're getting less chlorinated products as you move through the treatment process. So the amount of contamination is coming down, dechlorination is increasing, the amount of chlorinated uh, compounds is decreasing, uh, and you're getting these treatment zones. So case studies to exemplify that, what sort of time am I on? Oh, I've got a few minutes left, okay. So uh, this is a site from the Northwest of England. Um, the, the red line is the boundary of the site on the right there, beyond which is houses. Between that and the central line is a yard. That dashed line moving down through the middle, that is a, an echo drain running down the middle of the yard. On the left then is a dry cleaner. It's an industrial dry cleaner. It's where all the towels from all the hotels go for, and this thing's working all the time, doing dry cleaning on all these things. So they had a spill. Uh, in the tank here. So the tanker comes in, fills up the tank as ever. One of the ports has been left open. So it's going through the tank and, and straight onto the ground. Now it then moved down into the, the formation. What we've got on the site here is about a meter of granular made ground. Then you straight onto clays, but the sandy layers within the clays and they found that contamination went down about 11 meters and you've got concentrations suggestive of Dean apple within those sandy layers deep down. Not only did that happen, um, okay, so you've got the, 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 the spread of the contamination in the groundwater through that clay like, like so, but what also happened was the contamination moved along the surface of the yard, got into the drain, the drain is fractured, so you get it leaking into the ground in other places. So you get Dean apple quite far from the spill zone as well. So you've got a highly impacted zone uh, deep in the natural formation in the clay. And then what we actually got overlying that is the spill went into this permeable zone and spread underneath the factory as well in the shallow perch groundwater. So that's right underneath where they're working, where these big machine machines are, et cetera. So the approach we took was enhanced reductive dechlorination. In the low permeability zone, we used a low volume product and we injected on a tight injection grid down to about 11 meters, um, changing the, the aliquots, changing the dose as we go down through the formation to target those Dean apples. In the shallow zone, we used a high volume product, um, which is because the groundwater, the, the surface is highly permeable. What this meant is we could extend the injection grid to a six meter by six meter injection grid, which meant we could get in between the machinery and it reduced the amount of work we needed to do in that zone anyway, so that we didn't disturb this busy factory. So we would work on a, on a weekend and an evening doing that injection work. So this is what the application looks like. Um, so whatever the substrate yeah, you get generally, the, it'll come in a tub it'll come in a drum, it'll come in an IBC, then you'll have a, a, a mixing container, and then on the left there is your pump. Um, here, that's a high flow pump on the left there for the uh, high volume application. That then goes to your direct push rig, and this is a specialized injection direct push rig, so a, a window sampler on steroids essentially. 
and this is it working within the building itself you can see the exhaust pipe coming out to the outside and those big machines on either side those are industrial dry cleaners so you can see how we can't get to everywhere on the site but you put the product in the ground and it will move underneath the formation interlock those radii of influence uh, and ensure that you're treating the entire site and this is what the remediation looks like it's kind of boring and and that's a good thing you know we were on site for two weeks doing the injection work and, and then you're off there's then two years of in situ remediation and this is what it looks like not great for site visits if the regulators come in to see it buy lots of biscuits but it's good for the site owner in that they can continue to operate this site before it was going to be enhanced reductive dechlorination approach they were going to dig out the this yard down to 11 meters right next to an old factory um, it was going to cost in excess of a million pounds. I think this project was about 170,000 pounds. So there's a big saving there as well as the lack of disruption. So results in the shallow groundwater, uh, you see on the left, the baseline, there was only PCE, very low concentrations, um, no reductive dechlorination going on at all because it's very aerobic in this uh, perched water. We apply the product. You see immediately you start getting full reductive dechlorination right through to ethene. The, the PC has gone up because we've shunted that contamination into the groundwater. We break it down over time and you can see the PC goes down, degrades, TC goes up a little bit, degrades. TC breaks down so quickly, you, you, you really often see evidence of it just by the fact that you're creating DCE. So you see that light blue increases and then decreases. DCE increases and goes down and then you've got a little bit of vinyl chloride and, e and ethene coming through. And the intention of this remediation was to to remove all the PCE and show that enhanced reductive dechlorination is going on with this particular product it'll work for five years so this was 18 months in the consultant was allowed to get uh, closure of the site so that's at about we're, we're what concentrations are we up to PCE start around about 200 250 microgram per liter when we get into the deep ground water um, you've got Dean Apple down there so the, the baseline shows 50,000 micrograms per liter, which is high enough, and there's a little bit of reductive dechlorination going on, but actually there's a lot of hidden mass in there. So when you inject, you can see that second bar, we actually are dealing with a lot more PCE, we're up to about 200 microgram per liter, a bit more than that as well. But we drive that reductive dechlorination, you see that PCE come down dramatically, and then it's gone at the end there. You see that the TCE increases a little bit, the DCE increases and then is gone. And you can see as that PC goes, it's like turning off the tap. It all just drops away. You've got no problematic build of vinyl chloride. You've got ethene coming through. So we've removed the source. We've got an uh, ongoing reductive dechlorination. We've sure it's full uh, reductive dechlorination and that's the end of the site. How am I doing? I've just got one more. Okay, I'll be very quick. Um, this is the site I showed you before in, in Italy, very large site. Um, high concentrations in the source area. You've got Dean Apple in the source area. You've then got a contaminant plume that is naturally degrading. So you've got TC in the source area, but then you've got DC and vinyl chloride towards the, the uh, boundary of the site. You can see it's fairly complex, heterogeneous uh, geology there. So when injecting, uh, we needed to, to, to change the dose based vertically. What we did is we had a tighter grid in the source areas. We had a much wider grid in the um, in the plume areas. This is a very large site. This was 500 injection points. Compared to the last site, the value of this, this project was about 1.5 million euros. Um, this is what the injection looked like. We have two or three rigs moving across the site, injecting the product through direct push. And then here are the results. In the source area, you can see that the TCE drops down and is gone. You then get the, the DCE going down. Vinyl chloride comes up a little bit and is gone. And then we're down to very low concentrations. Down gradient in the plume, there is no source. So when you, there's no sorb material, there's no globules. So when you inject, you're not getting a, a bounce in, in the concentrations because everything you're detecting is already in the groundwater. You can see that it's breakdown products already at that point. So you see that we just speed up the, the breakdown of that DCE. It goes down, the vinyl chloride goes down too, uh, and, and we get to target. And that's the end. I hope you found that useful. Um, so if you do have any questions, um, fill it in uh, now, or you can email Sarah or, or email me, uh, and we'll get back to you uh, with those as soon as we can.
Brilliant. Thank you um, very much, Gareth, for that. That was um, that was really interesting, especially all those um, animations. Um, as always, there was quite a lot covered there. So uh, as Gareth said, if you do have any questions, then please fire them across um, and I will send back the responses. Um, also, just a quick thank you to um, Amanda from Regenesis. She is in the background uh, and she's helped with the organisation and the broadcast of the webinar today. So thank you very much, Amanda. Um, we will be looking to get another webinar done probably with Regenesis. I think we're, we're just discussing the next topic that will be in the next couple of months so um, just keep an eye out on the LinkedIn page um, and also in your emails I'll send I'll send some information through so uh, thank you once again for joining um, let me know if you or any colleagues want a copy of the webinar and hopefully um, uh, see and meet a lot of you in March at the conference so thank you very much <laughs>